Hello, it's George Leoniak, and welcome to New Geometry. Today, I'm excited to bring you a video about Buckminster Fuller's Jitterbug. We're going to show the sacred geometry uh, drawings related to the Buckminster Fuller Jitterbug transformations that it goes through. So we'll depict some drawings of this, have presentation set up, and we'll also discuss some um, things about tensegrity in relationship to the discussion of the uh, jitterbug model as well. So join me for this presentation to look at the sacred geometry of Buckminster Fuller's jitterbug and tensegrity concepts. All right, so I'm gonna just share my screen here and we'll work our way through this presentation. So here I'm just uh, showing the jitterbug transformation. Now, the, the overall outline of the form, the struts, creates a cube octahedron with all the struts with these flexible connectors. And just by placing the form on a hard surface, for instance, you can start to press down and compress it. And as it goes through this transformation, as you'll see in the drawings and discussion, it will go through some various different phases. These are showing two golden ratio transformations here. Uh, it will pass through golden ratio transformations until it compresses, or two, two major golden ratio transformations, until it compresses down to the uh, octahedron here at the end, which is the platonic solid with the uh, eight faces, eight equilateral triangles. Now the edges double up at this point. Until this point, you can see that they're slowly getting closer from the first, uh, as it slowly compresses. Now, the uh, equilateral triangle, of course, is the fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, element that's a part of this transformation. There's gonna be these eight equilateral triangles that are rotating around one another. And at this phase, these lower three here are really not part of this major transformation process. It pretty much just goes from cube octahedron to octahedron. Uh, but if we rotate and twist the form in the other direction, it will compress down to a flat equilateral triangle, which is in the middle here. And you can fold the form up to create a tetrahedron, of course, having the four uh, equilateral triangle faces, and then you have groups of uh, one, two, three, four edges showing up at each of the edges. All right, so that's just basically an overview of some of the few things you can do with the transformations, but I think it's some of the most relevant to studying the polyhedra. Now, here are the drawings of it, and we're gonna kind of hang out, transitioning a little bit back and forth between drawings because they really help um, see what's going on or they help me fi figure out and see what's going on to kind of freeze that transformation a little bit. And then I can really decipher with these circle templates, um, especially, particularly the in-between phases here, which are related to the outline of the icosahedron, the vertices of the icosahedron, which is a platonic solid, which has golden ratio proportions in it. And this over here is going to be related to a dodecahedron, and I'll describe that in just a bit. But here's the same progression that I was just kind of showing you. And, and these five images, we're going to kind of keep repeating and, and showing from different views of the form as well, not just these same exact ones. But they're going to kind of be our main five anchor points. Now, that's the cube octahedron and the octahedron at the other ex extreme. And then we have uh, this here, which is the icosahedron position, I call it here, because it's going to have the vertices. You see, this is the same drawing blown up. If I just, um, basically what's happening are the square faces of the cube octahedron are kind of buckling in on themselves. And when they get to the precise point on that compression, you can put a strut in there that will kind of connect that opening and if you do it in this instance with these three locations, that will provide the vertices in the correct position to create an icosahedron. 
And as it continues to compress further, it's going to go through Jensen's icosahedron, which uh, we'll describe that for a little bit more in detail later on. But it's in between these two golden ratio positions, kind of a almost dead center between the two. And then we come to what I call the dodecahedron position because, and I don't think Buckminster Fuller knew this at the time, but if you stop it at this point where these um, little openings are golden triangles, the vertices will actually provide uh, some of the vertices, you know, a portion of the 20 vertices uh, of the dodecahedron will be outlined here. And I'm showing you here where the red is where the those 20 where, where some of those 20 points would be basically you have to put a cube in the drawing and by placing a cube in it it would give you the remainder points the remaining points you need to go ahead and create the um, dodecahedron so you get 12 points 12 points of the icosahedron 12 points of the jensen's icosahedron 12 points of this but if you add a cube into the center of this all of a sudden it provides the other vertices to go ahead and create a dodecahedron. And then you have the octahedron at this end, which of course is now just gonna show your six vertices because those 12, all these have 12 until they go all the way down to double the struts and you come up with six, like these pictures are showing um, back here with the doubled struts for the octahedron. So I just want to show that kind of jitterbug transformation in another sequence of drawings um, where we're going to kind of picture collapsing the form between our, our hands like this from the sides, uh, keeping an equilateral triangle pointing upwards and one pointing down here, where it's here, and we're going to kind of compress it from the sides like that. Now you may say, well, geez, I could just do with that with the form in my hands. Why, don't, why should I do these drawings and stop it at these points? to see what's going on. Well, I've had this jitterbug for like six or seven years now, and I didn't fully understand it to the ability that I do now after having done the sacred geometry drawings. So in doing the drawings, you even personally doing the drawings, you're gonna start to have a deeper appreciation and understanding to see how it relates to um, the sacred geometry templates and the proportions and the ratios that show up through each of these transformations. So that's what sacred geometry is kind of revealing or is revealed to me in this process of doing this. So here's our cube octahedron at number one. And these are the triangle faces that will always be in the same, they're always the same size. They're always gonna be the same size equilateral triangles. They never change. But as I start to compress the form in, this is the icosahedron position, you'll notice that this yellow um, strut here that I put, this is kind of an invisible strut on the cube octahedron square face here. It's a rhombus, but I mean, it's, if it was flat to you, it'd be a square. So that's going to buckle, okay? And when it does, it creates a seam across, across here, which is actually where the blue line is, and that's folding in on itself. And it's folding in here, and it's folding in here. But even though it folds in, the vertices themselves, if I connect the lines, that will create the icosahedron. And of course, this is a classic square view drawing with the golden ratio circles to draw the icosahedron. And now as I compress the form further at number three, once again, still pressing those two equilateral triangles in from the left and right, here's the seam. You can now see it pops through here. So I can actually get a look at that seam in that instance at one of the locations as I compress it further, that seam is gonna be important. We're gonna talk about Jensen's icosahedron, like I said, but that little uh, divot, of course, you can't tell in this view, uh, that Jensen's icosahedron creates a 90 degree uh, angle when in that compression spot. So this is Jensen's icosahedron, and this right here, this angle is gonna be 90 degrees. So I have images that will show you what that's about as we go on further. Um, so we compress further, it's getting uh, you know, a little bit smaller as we go here, shrinking in on itself. Uh, the seam is really deep now, it's back in here behind the edge of this and uh, behind what we could see. 
And uh, this is where the golden triangles show up. These openings now are golden triangles. And this would create a dodecahedron, as I said before, if we placed a cube poking out the center of each of these equilateral triangles. Well, they're not equilateral here, but on the form they would be. And you have eight of those, then you create a dodecahedron. As we fully compress it all the way down, we skipped quite a lot of in, in between steps to get there, but we collapsed the, all the faces in to having the upward and downward pointing equilateral triangles. Do we get just your regular basic octahedron here held like this? Now, if I just slightly rotate this, you could see there's the other faces. But in our 2D drawing here, what we get is just an upward pointing triangle and low downward pointing triangle. They're not equilateral, though, just so you know, they're because that would have to be the flat face to us like this. So that would be the equilateral version of that octahedron, of course, would be back in these drawings that I've shown over here. And that's where you could see the other three faces surrounding that equilateral triangle. So just another view of the same thing, but it gives you that kind of uh, side compression to go ahead and see, or expansion, if you reverse the five through to one, um, another way to look at how these four, what this form looks like from that view. This was a cool little drawing that I did just to kind of um, isolate one of the equilateral triangles. And I know this is uh, kind of super busy, but everything is color coded here. And the Jensen's icosahedron here is now the yellow one in the middle. In the previous drawing, um, it's the middle one here. So I changed the color here to the gold color for the Jensen's. But the black is the cube octahedron, blue icosahedron, the red's the dodecahedron. Um, part of the dodecahedra, uh, dodecahedron, and then we've got the purple here. So if I just wanted to look at this one triangle here, which is this cube octahedron, and you can notice if you follow these points, one, two, three, four, five, you'll notice that that's this sequence right here. So this is really how this triangle now, the black one is folding up on itself until it finally makes its final location being up over here where the octahedron, uh, upper octahedron point is. So that's the real transformation from one to the other. So it's kind of like a still shot type of animation, um, but hopefully it's breaking down those pieces because these are all very specific stopping points that are easy to draw with the sacred geometry techniques uh, that will give you the proportions that are happening at those particular places um, so from cube octahedron to octahedron, you're, you've basically got Jensen's icosahedron in the middle between the dodecahedron and icosahedron positions on either side of that. So it's a very cool kind of uh, transformational process. And it's uh, hopefully, you may have seen some animations of this. There's always animations that do this back and forth. And personally, uh, I can look at those and, and appreciate them for what they are, but without actually, um, like seeing that isn't really understanding it, right? But hopefully by going through this presentation and contemplating it a little bit more, uh, opens up the doorway to help understand what's actually happening um, when we put it into the 2D, maybe that will reveal more about understanding the 3D version of this. So here I did it in the paper models as well. and. Uh, an interesting discovery here is, you know, I only have four across the top and I've been showing five. Well, the net, the little cutout template to make the icosahedron position is the same net that I would use to make that dodecahedron position. It, so really at that point, there's no difference in the net, in, in the angles of the net or anything. All it is is really just me squeezing it with my fingers. That's why I have this one placed up here uh, to help move those triangles into a golden um, triangle orientation at that point where these would be golden triangles. Now, it's not the angle that I'm showing, like if you're looking at it in 2D, it's not this V-notched angle. It's actually a triangle, golden triangle that would be placed between these three vertices and down here as well, and here as well. So when those are compressed to be golden triangles, 
the notch itself is part of a golden rhombus in 2D. And additionally, this is part of a golden rhombus in 2D. So this is 116.6. Um, and this is a 63.4 degree angle. And now this is uh, the Jensen's icosahedron angle of 90 degrees, and that's that form. It's very tough to tell, you know, if you picked up the two forms, uh, you'd have to look and turn it to the side because from this view, it's, it's tough to tell what the difference is between, you know, and we're looking at a photograph, so it's hard to know that this is just a little wider open than this one. In the 2D drawing, it may be a little bit more, it's going to be more easy to see that. But in this model, it's tough to see. But when we do turn to the side, you can see there's a pretty significant difference between the opening of that angle and our 90 degree angle here. So, um, I mean, that's neat because it's like these two are connected to the golden rhombus, the actual 2D V notch that I'm talking about, where this V notch here is uh, the 90 degree of the Jensen. So it's kind of golden rhombus uh, surrounding the, the 90 in the middle. And then of course your cube octahedron here and octahedron. So there's a progression and this one would slot right in over there. All right, so let's just talk about Jensen's icosahedron because uh, when I first heard about this form, I was quite curious about it. And that was, at least three or four years ago. And at the time I thought I would never be able to draw this. It sounded way more complicated than what, what I knew about drawing because it had those indented faces. But when I just recently started to take a look at it in this progression, I did all the other drawings first and I was like, geez, I should take a look at this Jensen's icosahedron. It probably relates to all this. And I did. And then I could really understand more about what I was reading about this form. And I was quite pleased to realize that drawing it was just a piece of cake because all you have to do is just draw your typical two-fold symmetry square view drawing, stand the lines out through those vesicas and you've got everything you need to draw it. There it is in the flower of life, as simple as you can do, be, right? So you don't need any golden ratio or anything like that to do this type of drawing, nothing fancy. And I'm gonna describe a little bit more, if you notice these gray lines that are outlining the form, I'm gonna come back to those in a bit, but if you're a savvy geometer, you probably already can visualize and understand what those outline is and where this form is found. But I'll get to that in just a minute. Also have some additional drawings that I did of it as well. So here's the typical square view, here's the triangle view. This was another view that was embedded in a diagram and another one when you slightly, when you rotate the outer form that it's embedded into, which I'll get to in a minute, you're just seeing the different position of the triangles in each of these and seeing the V notches from different uh, orientations, what they look like in those drawings. So here's the big unveiling about Jensen's icosahedron, which was quite a big surprise to me of how um, easy it is actually to draw or how how we've actually taken kind of a portion of a larger form uh, and just uh, highlighted a specific piece of it. So Jensen's icosahedron really is, uh, you know, here's a surprise. It's, it's nothing more than being just a portion of um, a truncated octahedron. Now a truncated octahedron uh, is an Archimedean solid. I have one around here somewhere, I think. Here it is. Truncated octahedron, Oct Archimedean solid is a hexagon and square faces. So what you're looking at in Jensen's icosahedron is, here's Jensen's icosahedron, the same drawing that I just previously showed you with those equilateral triangles. There's the 90 degree V notch. Well, the vertices actually give you just a portion of half of it. It gives you half of a truncated octahedron. If I rotate the form, the Jensen's icosahedron, here I have it in red, let's say I've rotated it to create the blue triangles on those same hexagon faces, rotating it like so, well, that gives me all the vertices of the truncated octahedron um, and two Jensen's icos icosahedron right there. So that's, to me, it was, a, it was a bit of a shock because I really didn't know that Jensen's icosahedron would be so simple. 
but all the proportions are easily written out in the mathematics. I just didn't know them at the time and didn't make the connection to 3D geometry. It seemed like something really far out because when you look at this little form with all the, uh, the divots and indentations of it like this and trying to think, well, geez, how am I ever going to draw this to realize it's just back in the truncated octahedron? Well, then now I can draw it. So back to our previous uh, slide here, you can see that the gray outline, well, there's a big hexagon in the middle. That's where one of the equilateral triangles are. And the gray, light gray outline is also hosting, holding one of the equilateral triangles over here. I mean, it's not equilateral, but it's um, tilting away from us. So there it is. It's right in a truncated octahedron the whole time. It's just a portion of it. But this gets to my next uh, point, um, because we're going to now place all the all these transformations that I've been discussing so far all in a large octahedron. So these gray lines, because we know that the cube octahedron, of course, can be looked at as a truncation of your regular octahedron. Right? So if you just truncate at the midpoints of your octahedron, then you have your cube octahedron by removing all the gray here. So we know also that the um, icosahedron can be placed with inside an octahedron. And we also know, of course, that, well, these are the transformations. So here's the transformation of the previous one I showed you, the icosahedron one I was talking about, icosahedron position. Here's your Jensen's icosahedron. Here's your dodecahedron position. And then finally, we have our smaller octahedron down with inside, half the size of the uh, original octahedron. Now, this is what it looks like, and it looks kind of like something from Star Wars over here. And maybe all this does. but. Um, but now we've placed it in a bigger platonic solid. And when, and, and this is from discoveries of mine from years ago, which I just kind of felt, well, hey, why don't I just take, because I, I knew an icosahedron, for instance, would be in a dodecahedron. So some of my earlier videos was like, hey, why don't I just take that icosahedron and I'll just uh, rotate it around and I'll create a golden hexagon face version so there's the one icosahedron but if i do a second one and i don't know where that other form is but if i do a second one on here um pointing the other direction i'll just essentially come up with and you'll see in the next slide a truncated version with golden hexagon faces so here are the two stars now for the jensen's icosahedron i put the second i just rotated the form and then I've also done that with the dodecahedron position one, rotated the form. So on my next slide here, now I'm just showing that around those stars, I can go ahead and connect all the vertices. And then if I remove the stars, because it gets a little busy there, it will look like this inside the octahedron. And now I have cube octahedron, truncated octahedron, golden hexagon version of it, which is related to the icosahedron, dodecahedron positioned one, which is related to the dodeca. So that's another golden hexagon face. Now, just so you know, to remember to create the dodecahedron, all you'd have to do is create a square poking through those eight faces, and then you have all the vertices that you need to create the dodecahedron. So that's why I'm calling it the dodeca position because it's, only, it's, in a, it's not all there. You just need eight additional vertices. But if now if I remove all those uh, outline of the gray, well, then I have these truncated versions in the middle, um, which these two are seldom discussed, probably not many other places at all that I've seen other than here at New Geometry. And uh, of course, I built those forms in, in my previous old videos and, and discussed them quite a bit. So I was quite pleased to make this kind of transition in relationship to Bucky's work, uh, especially highlighting not only because you know, he knew about the icosahedron version. I don't think he looked at it this way of seeing that, yeah, it's just, you know, rotating two of them around will create this truncated version. And I hadn't seen on the Wikipedia site that discusses Jensen's icosahedron. No one has discussed 
that it's connected to the truncated regular octahedron. So maybe that's a new discovery. I can't imagine it would be because it seems pretty straightforward. But when you don't actually draw the sacred geometry like this and embed these forms into other things, it's easy to miss that or it's just left out as extraneous information. But to me, it helps make the connections between all these forms that I'm showing here. And then we have the dodecahedron position. So we have two golden hexagon faces and they're same size hexagon face. You just flip it around and then you get the smaller square or you get the larger square here. All right, so yeah, just, I guess just a summary of that one more time. Uh, the three forms in the middle here, the three uh, blue, the golden one and the red one, they uh, basically, if you just have uh, opposite triangles opposing those, that will create these truncated versions of the uh, icosahedron and truncated, it would create different versions of the truncated octahedron. And that's basically what I'm trying to say here is Jensen's icosahedron up here is just one piece of this regular um, truncated octahedron, which means that these are also part of that. So everything is happening in that big octahedron here. Okay. So that's kind of like where all this transformation is happening in an octahedron that's around kind of an invisible octahedron around our jitterbug. And uh, yeah, I think I was just going to illustrate here. If I pull this down here, you could see I've just laid that over top. So you could see that the vertices uh, were just lining up underneath the same forms there. All right, so we're gonna look at the jitterbug transformation from uh, one more way, and I'm just gonna describe it in a little bit different terminology because we're gonna to start to talk about tensegrity in a moment because um, it's a different way that the models can be transformed. And what's happening here with the jitterbug, as you could see very easily at the model, all the edges are the same. There's no elasticity to the edges. The elastic part is at the vertex. So when we have a rigid edge model and it starts to fold in, so here's your cube octahedron triangle, the black here. And as it starts to fold and create the V-notch, just keep focusing on the yellow V-notch, the red V-notch until it all folds up and creates the octahedron, which is actually the same size as the face of the uh, cube octahedron here. It's that black square. That's also the octahedron that would be inside behind it. So as I fold that in like that, you're going to notice that um, it starts out here for the furthest position out. And as I slowly work my way in, uh, I finally end up, uh, well, I start actually, excuse me, I start at the cube octahedron. And as I press in on the cube octahedron, it bows out, it blossoms out, kind of arcs around and then slowly starts to work itself back over to compressing back to the vertices of the octahedron. So it kind of has an arc like this, all right? So that means that there's elasticity between the crossbar piece that is between the uh, cube octahedron and the Jensen's icosahedron. The, the, there's its stretching and, and uh, and, and squishing between the, that, that crossbar there. All right, so let's look at the tensegrity model where all that is gonna be kind of opposite here. In this model, looking at the same drawing, and in a moment I'll show you both drawings together so you can compare them more easily. For this model, we have our cube octahedron in black here once again around, and here I've outlined that in purple because the purple is the is remember it's the same square, but it's the cube, it's the octahedron in the middle. But um, that's the outline of the uh, square of the triangle. And now everything is going to stay with inside the square because this edge, like this bar that's going from here to here, doesn't change at all. It's a fixed crossbar in the middle of the form. But that means because that's fixed. It means that as those triangles are rotating or, 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 or you know, going through the rotation to collapse in on themselves to create the octahedron, as I do that, 
That means there's got to be elasticity in those edges of the triangles. So compared to the comparing to that to the jitter mug jit, jitter jitterbug model, what happens? Uh, the model is going to look completely different. And I made this just out of popsicle sticks and rubber bands um, by just notching the popsicle sticks at the end. You can take the rubber bands and now the rubber bands are creating the triangles. And this is roughly a Jensen's icosahedron here with nine, supposedly, you know, close to 90 degree angle notch here. And this is looking down at the kind of hexagon orientation of that same form. Uh, the rubber bands are the triangles, and now we have these six crossbars. And they're, the, the popsicle st sticks may help you see this. We have two going across that are in unison, you know, kind of on the same plane together. And then we have two here. You can see one in the distance and one closer. Those two are on the same plane. And here's two pointing towards us that are on the same plane. Now, if you press these all in together, that would essentially create your X, Y, and Z axes. And so really what's happening in this form is your X, Y, and Z axes are kind of, and that's an octahedron, right? So here's an octahedron with X, Y, and Z axes, right? And if I go ahead and separate the crossbars now at this point in the middle and pull those apart on those main planes, the X, Y, and Z planes, then all of a sudden they separate and they're gonna start to create those uh, gaps in the middle and creating the various transitions between the you know, 90 at the midpoint of that transition and everything in between on either side of that. So here we go, look at that, the uh, two of the transitions together. Here's the one with the rigid edges and the uh, elastic crossbars. And now this is the tensegrity version. So that's your jitterbug up here. And here's your tensegrity transformations with your rigid crossbars going across. But your uh, elastic uh, triangles. And now these two models have, these two drawings have been scaled to the same size here. Uh, so nothing actually really changes in, in doing the drawing. Well, I mean, there is something, let's say in isolation, nothing changes about these drawings on the right here. But the only thing that's gonna change is the size of the form between both of these. So this icosahedron position one is the same drawing. Jensen's one same. Dodecahedron, dodeca position, the same. The only thing is if we compare the jitterbug model, they're a lot larger in these three transformations than they are in these three here. These are progressively getting smaller as it condenses down to this size of the octahedron. The, octahe the cube octahedron and the octahedron are the same size. They don't, when they, when they start off the same size, regardless of the tensegrity or jitterbug version, the cube octahedron and octahedron are the same. So everything really happens, whether you've got rigid edges uh, or elastic edges, which has a lot to do with your crossbar in the middle. All right, so... Um, now we can take a look at a tensegrity transformation from the hexagon orientation. We looked previously about what this looks like in the jitterbug transformation. And with this, we're going to follow the movement of a single equilateral triangle. And in the fixed model of the jitterbug, the uh, triangle of the octahedron and the cube octahedron, the, which are the purple and black triangles here on the left, they stay always oriented in the same direction as the, it, in the, uh, on the compressions on the, on, for that face. So let me just hop back to the beginning of the drawing so you could see that. Here's your cube octahedron. It's a downward pointing triangle. Here's your octahedron downward pointing triangle. These triangles are all for the whole transformation. That face that's facing us is always the same 
Um, that doesn't change its orientation. But now in this transformation, as the form starts to rotate, they rotate through its transformation process. It's starting, let's say, okay, I have it at the octahedron here. So well, let's say it's getting larger, but it's going octahedron, dodecahedron, Jensen's icosahedron, cube uh, icosahedron blue, cube octahedron black. And I mean, it looks like it's done a full 180 degree around here, but really what's happened is that that is a migrating um, point that's kind of slowly getting smaller as we work our way along here. And then it gets larger again as we work our way back around. So it's a twisting motion that's happening there with this tensegrity. And hopefully with this model, you could see it it's a little lot going on there, I know, but if you look at the, uh, this is the little section of the triangles, it's basically moving along this hexagon edge. So there's your black cube octahedron. And then here are all your transformations going in between here. And then it's coming out to the top of the um, octahedron there. And this is what's happening now, these hexagons that you see around, you notice that they're all on these key circles here. So these are the golden ratio circles. This is another drawing based on the golden seed of life. So what I realized, if you've seen any of my other videos, and especially the ones based on Metatron's Cube 2.0, that's a video, and the age of the octahedron, I was already doing jitterbug transformation or, or this tensegrity transformation in those drawings. And I didn't even really know it at the time because what I show in those is um, kind of, a, 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 without focusing on these uh, isolated triangles, I was showing you the those truncated octahedra that I showed previously here in the slideshow, going through these transformations. But here's your first golden ratio circle at blue. Here's your midpoint between the two. That's the Jensen's one. That's the 90 degree one. There's your next golden ratio circle. Uh, off of the red one, and then we're back to our octahedron. So all of it was provided in the golden seed of life. And it, we, it's super easy to draw. Um, here's the tensegrity transformation. I just broke it out of the uh, circle template. So hopefully maybe it becomes a little bit more easy to see. And then I've broken out each of the individual forms by themselves so you could see. The only one from this view where you kind of see that kind of crossbar going across is uh, right here at this icosahedron. So that's the little notch right in there. Now to make it an icosahedron, all you have to do is create, you know, connect these bars here. And once again, this is why it's so important to be able to draw these forms accurately because now we're putting them into motion, um, you know, with the correct golden proportions here. Now your Jensen's icosahedron down here, this one, uh, the line going straight across here is just, a that's actually flat. That's a kind of flat plane going across there. And it's not till you get to the dodecahedron. So this is, it doesn't have an edge below this, but on this one, we'd have to connect the point from here to here. And I did highlight that with dotted lines on this red one inside there. But just picture here going across a little red dotted line. And that's kind of that seam, that little crease that you see here that's blue. That would be a dotted red crease going on the inside there on that little seam. But here it's completely flat to our eye. So when we're looking straight down at it, that's the 90 degree notch uh, from this perspective. That's what it would look like. Um, okay, now uh, we're getting close to the end of the slides here. I just wanted to just uh, summarize one more time. I've kind of combined a few slides throughout. We just were talking about two different things. We have all of Bucky's work, two different concepts of Bucky's work, Buckminster Fuller. We had the jitterbug transformations here that I showed with the actual model here. Um, it's hard to hold it in the position of the Jensen's icosahedron, and these are just rough estimates, honestly. But in the drawings themselves, I can clearly depict where each of those locations are. And once again, a cube octahedron, this is the icosahedron position, your Jensen's icos uh, icosahedron, which now we know is just part of 
uh, the truncated octahedron, the Archimedean solid. It's just focusing on the one triangle in a hexagon there. That's why we don't need any additional fancy circles to do this drawing. We just need the seed of life pretty much. And then we are compressing a little bit further there, as you could see on the model above, held in the same orientation, compress a little further. We get that seam deeper in, uh, that would be compressing it to have the 36 degree triangle faces. That's the dodeca position and creating a dodecahedron. If we create a cube at these other particular vertices on here, we would go ahead and draw a dodecahedron, which I showed at the previous uh, like slide two or three back in the beginning all the way down to your octahedron and then the Ted Segrity model without the circle drawings because they're essentially the same as this drawing up here. You'd have to do it in this drawing to get each of those. And these are the two kind of ways that I draw have drawn these forms as the, you know, in, in past uh, uh, new geometry uh, videos, but this all relates to this model. Remember now this has non-flexible ridges flexible, uh, flex, flexible uh, flex elastic edges and the rigid crossbars. And of course, this one has the flexible vertices and rigid uh, faces, uh, edges, edges of the faces there. All right, I just wanted to show you that this whole thing, I think it was, this was a really cool slide. It was a real culmination slide for me because really I did all these drawings all in one drawing pad and uh, on the iPad there in a single sheet to create this whole presentation pretty much other than the photographs. But, it, you know, of course, huge thanks for the inspiration of Bucky. And I was so happy to see that New Geometry was able to take some of his um, beautiful, concepts of putting this geometry into motion through the concepts of the jitterbug and tensegrity, I didn't know how uh, new geometry had been kind of helping create the architecture, the, the, this, the, uh, the templates to be able to make that happen. So, you know, this, this little drawing pad here with all the images all done to scale and everything like that with the nets and everything, everything's all done except for this image up here to get one of these. Um, uh, transitions of the, uh, not transition, one of the uh, Jensen's icosahedron drawings, um, but all done to scale. I mean, this is really like the practice of new geometry, um, kind of all being worked out using the golden ratio to help get those in between transitions and everything. Uh, and you can do it too. Uh, new geometry is a fantastic way to get into sacred geometry and drawing these types of things and start to really, like I said before, have a hands-on practical experience, learning to either build the models as well. Um, it's easy to go out and buy one of these or get one of these kits to make one of these. And we really, the light bulb really starts to go off in your journey with, say, with, with understanding these things if you have an inclination for this when you start to have the hand-drawn compass and, compass and tools in your hands, um, working with this, it will unlock a whole new dimension of your relationship and understanding to this um, beautiful work of sacred geometry and open the door for you starting to uh, interact with great uh, inspirations like Bucky and Coxeter and other fantastic, wonderful geometers who have really advanced the art of sacred geometry um, in the past hundred years. So new geometry is providing an opportunity and really giving you some golden keys to start to explore that. So check out new geometry courses, subscribe to this channel. That's the, and uh, check out the new geometry Facebook group as well. Um, new geometers and uh, You've got apprentices, lots of courses over at New Geometry Courses, so maybe I'll see you at one of those. So much love and appreciation. Thanks for joining me for this video, and I hope that was um, uh, enjoyable and uh, educational and helped you understand more about the sacred geometry of Buckminster Fuller's Jitterbug and Tensegrity concepts. All right, see you. Bye.